and therefore some of the issues that I've come up against and how I've addressed those. So, pretty simple um, agenda. Who am I? What am I talking about? Why should you even listen to me at all? Um, the history, and then what problems I've come up against, what I've done about them, and why NetBSD is a good choice for solving these problems. I live and work in the Cambridge in the UK. I've got a PhD in psychoacoustics, which is the psychology of hearing. I have no formal background in computer science at all. Um, been a NetBSD user since 1994. Um, one of the obvious questions is why NetBSD as opposed to anything else, and uh, I could just answer that by saying, well, it got there first. I've um, been a NetBSD developer or committer since the start of the year. I'm the managing director or CEO of my own company, Precedence Technologies. I'm a Citrix certified administrator and a Citrix certified sales professional. Um, if you don't know what Citrix is, I'll be uh, touching on that later. So what is a thin client? Thin client is a device that's got small physical size, but that's not actually a requirement. The, the thin bit isn't that it is physically small, it's that it's a thin software layer. It's no moving parts, it doesn't need them. It doesn't need to have particularly high performance. It's got no local storage, um, just local software, um, no applications. Very low power consumption because it doesn't have moving parts, which means that in these days of um, carbon emissions and things like that, it's a, it's a good way to go. Fast startup time. It's centrally managed from the network, which is the important thing, so you're not having to go and configure things individually on each machine. And it tends to contain network client software rather than applications themselves. So you're not gonna, if you're not going to have OpenOffice, Microsoft Word on running on one of these machines, even if that's what you're looking at on the screen, you're, con you're running client software only. And the sort of software we're talking about are things like Citrix ICA, um, Microsoft IDP, X, normal terminal software, web browser, um, VNC. Now web browser is of course quite a large application, but it's not inventing data. The stuff you're seeing is coming from somewhere else, so it's, it's clearly a network client. Um, my experience is I use Mascomp Unix, which nobody's ever heard of, uh, and Irix as part of my PhD. At the time I was an avid Acorn user, uh, which is running a company nothing to do with uh, Unix. Um, is ARM based, and I wanted a Unix I like to learn on. Acon had their own um, operating system, RISC-X, but this was right at the end of the period when Unix was really expensive before the BSD that we know came along. Um, it, it only ran on old machines, it wasn't going to run on any of the modern stuff. So the RISC-BSD project was launched in 1994. This was basically a port of NetBSD to Acon RISC-PCs. It then became NetBSD ARM32, it was, it was imported in 1996, I believe. Uh, and then in uh, 2001, it became Acon32 as part of a, of a reordering. I started working at Acon, so uh, I wasn't just living the dream. Well, I was living the dream. I, you know, I was doing it in my spare time and also doing it during the day. Um, now, in 1996, as soon as I started there, um, Acon in some ways ceased to exist in terms of its education um, part. It joined up with Apple UK, the found a company called Exemplar Education. It was the second biggest supplier of IT to UK education. I was transferred there full time. Now, in around that period, Acorn launched the Network Computer Reference Design, um, which was all handled by Oracle. That was their idea, but they looked for a co uh, company who could do this. Acorn had always had an operating system that was ROM-based. It was ideal for building this sort of product around. Um, so low power, 48 megahertz ARM, 7500, not much RAM, custom version of RISCOS, blah, 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 blah. But what it did do is it booted from NFS, um, and that was obviously quite good if you wanted to uh, stick a Unix box somewhere in there. In, in October 1996, Exemplar were given two of these. One, of course, went off to sales and marketing who waved it around and said, this is the future. But I managed to take one of those and said, look, we can do something with this. So. I booted one of these from a RISC PC, wrote a product based on this web based administration, web mail package, um, and then an application software framework which actually ran locally on these machines. And from 1997, this was sold to UK schools throughout the UK, clearly. Um, 
there was some talk about selling it in some places um, in Europe, but never really caught on very much. We called that the NC server at the time. The interesting thing there is it means that Apple was selling a BSD Unix-based product back in 1997, a long time before Mac OS, Mac OS X. Um, I saw a pre-release a, a, a year after we were already selling it. Um, I'll ignore the by the way. And so, 1998, they said, well, this is actually quite good. We'll take you out of technical support. You can actually develop this full time. Fantastic. Um, it then takes off. We've started to roll these things out throughout the UK. Um, there's about 1,000 units um, of the clients being sold. About 60 networks went in. This was all over a two month period. So we were starting to get some, some driving of, of this product. Uh, this, was, this was a new idea, remember. Everybody else was, you just got to get your PCs, you've got to have lo loads of them down your desk, it needs to have loads of space. And we're going, no, what you actually need is really thin things on your desk, good servers at the back end, we'll manage them for you, you don't need to do that. This is the way forward. But then, March 1999, Acon said, we don't want any of this market anymore. We've been doing it for long enough. No one wants to buy our crappy old stuff anyway. Uh, does anyone want to buy it? Um, so Apple said, yeah, we'll have a piece of that, seeing we already own half of it, we'll have the other bit, and we'll pay you a nominal sum. Which meant that Exemplar was now 100% Apple. But of course, they had all these products which were nothing to do with them, and the definite not invented here idea. And also, because of the successful summer we just had, it meant there was all these customers who'd signed up for support contracts. Uh, we'd never sold support contracts before, this was a new thing, but they'd, they'd, uh, they'd bought these, and someone needed to support it. But I was made redundant, and I was the person who wrote the software, and I was the person who had the book stopped here um, support. If somebody needed to know the definitive answer, they had to come to me, but I was there no longer. So, April 99, I said, right, I'm going to set up my own company, I'm going to support all this, you'll contract me to do this, but what I'll need is clearly all the source code, everything I've worked on, and I don't want to be paying for it, and they said, that's fine by us because we could see ourselves being in hot water from all these customers if we don't do that. So, a new hope. We set up April 99, we start get rid of these risk PCs, which are slow, 233 megahertz machines, 600 kilobits a second disk, terrible for servers. Um, go for something slightly less terrible, um, still ARM based, and reposition it as being an internet survey, do all these things. It isn't just for booting some servers, some, some clients. It can do email, it can do all that sort of stuff. We then swapped to Intel stuff because we felt we had to. Started to rewrite it completely in 2002. It's still selling well today. But from a client point of view, we were still selling the same old things. These were 48 megahertz machines. They'd come out in 1996. That was the design. The design hadn't changed. Um, people didn't really didn't want them anymore. They're very proprietary. Now the problem is, uh, I'll just touch on what the Citrix and ICA stuff is. Um, from Unix background, of course we're used to things being multi-user, just always has been. Um, but Windows isn't. Bill's big idea is you have a box on your desk and you pay him for a copy of Windows to run on that because that's the way he makes his money. Citrix came along and said, well, you know, we don't really need to do that because these things are difficult to manage. So why don't we get Windows, we'll license it off of Microsoft, make it multi-user, and then we'll invent some way that you can talk to us. We, we could use X, and in fact, some of their OEMs did use X. Um, but they invented their own thing called ICA, Independent Client Architecture, which is a really optimized protocol uh, designed for use over 28.8 modems. Works really well. But um, it's closed source. No one knows how this protocol works. Um, Acorn had an old version of the, of the source. But of course, they'd, they'd gone bust or disappeared. No one was working on this. And so we were stuck with this client software, which was four versions old. There was nowhere to go. I evaluated, I was thinking, well, you know, these are, these are ARM-based machines. NetBSD will actually boot on these. I did some diskless booting. And I thought, well, what we could do is we could even run these under Linux emulation. There was absolutely no benefit. It was going to be, it's going to be so slow. Plus, also, the Linux ARM ICA client was equally as old, because they've not updated that either. From an ideological point of view, I refused to sell anything to do with uh, Windows CE, which was a competing product. So I looked around and found some Linux ones. Um, but as I'm saying here, they either had poor support, the software was very basic, um, or they'd look pretty, 
but they'd be expensive. It, nothing seemed to be ideal. I needed to do something about this. So I had a brainwave. I was driving back in the car. I thought, what I'll do is there's all these people with old PCs. We've been telling these people, you don't need these anymore. But why don't we take those? They've got horsepower. They would be skipping them. Why don't we just reformat our hard disks, turn them into thin clients that you can manage centrally? Call it Thinit. Started working when I got back to the office. Three weeks later, I did the first release. Um, <laughs> and we'd soon sold 500 copies of this. Uh, we, we had whole sites that had gone over to this. It was based on a NetBSD 1.6, very basic installation, so it's no manual pages, um, no compilers. Um, running read-only from the disk, so the, um, the, the root file system mounted read-only, uh, various scripts to remotely manage it. But then had basic clients for Citrix ICA, Microsoft RDP, and we had to use Linux emulation, but that meant we could run the latest ICA client so we could be feature compatible with anyone else out there. It's also designed to be very easy to install, the idea being if this messes up, it doesn't matter, you can reinstall it in two or three minutes. If your hard drive fails, it doesn't matter, just throw the machine away, get another one, reinstall it, you're back where you are. You've got no settings on these machines. The, the clients are completely commodity products. You don't need to think about uh, having to configure them. Now, the next brainwave is I'm getting sick of these Linux-based clients. They're too expensive. I have to import them from, from Germany and, oh, nothing against Germans, but, um, you know, I was having to deal with these people over the phone and they had such strict, strict ways we had to deal with warranties and things. It was, it was really difficult. Um, so I tried to look for alternatives. But then I thought, well, hang on, we've got our own operating system here that sort of pretty much does the job. Why don't we just get some really good hardware, put the two together? So we thought, let's get the, the fastest hardware we can find that's, that's fanless, so it must have no moving parts, needs to be small, and then we'll get our software to run on it. So we found some of those, built for us in Taiwan. Um, we released um, the TCX, which is our, our first version of this, it was released in, in 2000, uh, 2005 in September. Uh, it's a gigahertz processor, 128 megs of flash, was the one, it actually had 64 in the first version. Um, and 128 megs of RAM, it's now 256 megs of RAM. But that's, we didn't need that, but they just said, well, it's going to cost you no more. Um, with the flash, they said you can have twice as much for about a, a pound more, but also it's four times as quick, so that was a no-brainer. Uh, then we did a TCM, which is basically a laptop, but the same thing, so it has no hard drive in it, just has a, a flash unit replacing the, uh, the hard drive in that. And we finally got round to replacing the old version that we've got to convert old PCs. So we now have Thinit version 2, 4 PC. Yes. Precisely what flash? Um, flash or or what? They basically look just like hard drives. The ones for the laptops are exactly the same form factor. You just take the hard drive out and stick one of these in. Um, the ones we have in the TCXs just drop into the um, ATA on, on the motherboard. So yeah, the, the, it's all completely manage, we're not having to worry about uh, load le uh, leveling and things like that. So finally th this month we released the version so you can convert any old PC um, using the new software. Now the problems we have to address here is it needs to run from Flash. Um, it needs to be very easy to build. We need to be able to test it while we're developing it easily enough without having to um, install it, boot the machine up, see how it works, all that. We also should be able to boot from, ver from various sources. So instead of the old version that just ran from the hard disk, we should be able to do this from CD-ROMs, uh, we should be able to just PXC boot it, we should be able to run from flash hard disk, um, USB pen drives, all those sort of things. The old version had um, green kernel messages coming up telling all the devices that it had found that scare off the customers who are using it. Um, and historically our business has been in schools, uh, and so they just think it's broken when it's spewing forth garbage about you know, all sorts of WD0 and stuff like that. So we needed to make it slick to use, um, slick to look at, um, no command line needed, any of that sort of stuff. It needs to be really modular. We need to be able to extend this. Uh, if I'm doing all this work to um, go for a new way of working, we need to make sure that I don't have to completely reinvent it again a year down the line. So we need to have more session types. We're not, not just basic um, accessing Windows resources using Citrix or Microsoft RDP. Um, and clearly, if it's going to run from Flash, or we want to load it over network, it's a very small footprint. We also need to make sure that people can't just steal it. Um, when using these things for commercial products, we don't want people to just steal it and start selling it themselves. It needs to be centrally configured. 
otherwise it wouldn't really be much of a thin client. It needs to be remotely managed. We don't want to have to go around to each of these machines um, seeing what they're doing. We need it to run really well on our own hardware, because that was the original purpose of it, but also because we're going to provide this as a general purpose for any PC, it needs to have really good hardware support. So the way we actually address these problems. Now the NetBSD installer has a FFS file system which is embedded into the kernel, which means you can have this one file which is the kernel. When it's loaded up, it will automatically mount this embedded file system as root and it's read and it's read write. Which means it's really easy to extend the, these images. The, the, the build infrastructure is very easy for us to just say whatever we want in here. We can use this for any task. Um, there's a few things I had to address. We needed to get it to boot multi-user because this is designed for an installer. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be running any, um, anything more than just the installer but, and so I needed to do tweaks to make it multi-user but that wasn't a big deal. Um, we need to obviously make it easy to build. Um, and so we've built SH in, in NetBSD, which allows us to run one command. It'll build everything, for, including all the tools. It'll build us ISO images. It'll do it for any of the supported platforms, um, from any other supported platform. Um, also means, of course, we can use fastest machines to build um, things for slower machines. And so a single make can do a lot of work. We want to make it easy to test. Now, because of the of, of virtualization and Zen, we can make it so this will just generate an image which we can then just go straight into Zen, does it work? So it's very easy for us to run this thing through, boot it up into a virtual machine, does it work? Yeah, it does, brilliant. Or no, it doesn't. So we're not having to install this on a hard disk every time, power off and, off and on and off machines. Um, and the good thing about Zen is because you've got a very limited selection of device drivers, the um, probing phase of the, of the boot is incredibly quick. So we're straight into running the software. We're not having to worry about kernel issues. Um, and we can also do that um, using nested X drivers. So it, as far as the, the virtual client is concerned, it thinks it's got a real display, but actually it's just running in a window. Now, to boot from various sources, how do we deal with that? Now, because we're running from this embedded um, file system, it means it's actually quite easy because we've only got a kernel that we need to run, and it's just how do we load that. And we've got loads of bootloaders. We, 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 can, already, we can already PXC boot. We can already boot from all sorts of different file systems. So we're already pretty much there. Um, new stuff that's just been coming out is CD boot, which means that we don't have to deal with floppy emulation, and so we don't have a limit um, on the image that we're going to be booting, which of course is important as we're adding more and more bits into it, and you always get bloat. It also means we can choose different kernels from a CD, which means we can have um, you can run from a CD and, and run as a live system, or you can say, right, I'm going to boot into the installer. Um, we can still build floppies. So we used to do the old version. Uh, we'd need a lot more floppies nowadays. Um, but, yeah, that's no big deal. Um, we've got a, a, a new bootloader which allows us to um, put this onto um, an or, um, a, a fat formatted USB drive that already has files on it without having to allow extra space at the start of it, so you're not going to lose any data. That's a good benefit. Um, future ways we could possibly boot this, well I'd like to be able to boot this from NTFS, which would then mean you could just drop these files straight onto your Windows machine and boot straight into it. We can't do that at the moment because we don't have a boot xx underscore NTFS, but we can maybe come up with one of those in future. So how do we make this thing to have a slick user interface? As I was saying, all this green text coming up about all the devices it's found and IQs and all that sort of stuff, we need to get rid of that. Um, which is harder than it should be. Um, in the bootloader we can give it a flag to say we want you to boot silently. If you do that, it doesn't boot silently at all. It just gets rid of some of the text and puts some random slashes in the middle of it and it's known better. Now, the way this works is we've got some printfs which are printing things to the screen, um, which is the stuff that's generally in the older device drivers. New stuff, we have this whole API which says, is this a normal message, is it a, an error message? And, and if so, we can divert this to various places. We can divert it to, to a log file or we can actually have it going to the console. But the problem is, is this all needs converting across? And someone needs to make a value judgment about, is this printf an error message? Is it a debug message? Or is it just informational? And so we can't go and do a mechanical thing on this. And 
basically no one's had the time to go and do this yet. So my cheap hack was we just get printf and make it do the same thing as the version which just doesn't write to the kernel. And as soon as you do that, you get a, a nice message that just says detecting hardware, a little twiddler goes on, and then you're out of it. So that, that's, that's pretty slick. Um, I locked down the bootloaders because we don't want people uh, trying to boot single user. Um, we, so that's password protected. Uh, we hardwire the, the path to the kernels. We don't want people trying to randomly TFTP boot from other things. Um, that's easy enough to do. Um, pretty much all of the RC, sy RC system has been rewritten because we don't want to be doing lots of the stuff that these would do. There's lots of dependencies on, on other daemons which we're never going to use. And so we always need to get rid of all that. And we also need to differentiate between what's actually going to the consoles that the user's going to see and what we may need if something goes wrong later. Um, and so that's the difference between the friendly text and the debugging stuff because we need to make sure that the users are happy and they can see that it's doing something, but they don't need all sorts of hieroglyphics scrolling up past them. We can also liven this up by doing a bit of colour text and um, moving the cursor around so we have nice boxes and, and, and things like that. Um, and thanks to uh, Jared McNeil's excellent work, we have now have a, a Visa frame buffer which allows us to run at um, pretty much any resolution. It means we can have splash screens um, so it's full colour splash screens, logos, they can be animated and so this then becomes um, an, an attractive thing to look at as, as it boots. Um, obviously if you're doing an embedded, uh, out and out embedded device like a firewall type system, you're not worried about any of this. Um, and so the original answer when you'd say to people on the main list, well I don't want to see all these messages, is they say oh we'll just divert it to a serial console, that'll be fine. Um, but actually it wasn't, because you still needed to tell the user what was going on. You may need to do things in future, and also they may have things that want, they want to attach to that serial port that they may use like a digital camera. Um, we don't want all sorts of stuff going down to that. We also want to make it um, easy to configure. So we've written some um, GTK um, configuration things, and stuck a few screen savers on, makes it pretty as well. So cheap and easy stuff, but you get a win with the, uh, the customers. Um, slide that looks really bad, but this is the splash screen. Um, the idea being that we have animation of the uh, smoke coming up here from this super fast cheetah that's running with a few little thin clients on its back showing how small and light they are. Um, if you don't have a machine that's capable of running this, um, yeah, you can't see this at all. Uh, it, this just basically says detecting hardware, and there's a little twiddler there. It then goes into this mode, which basically says, yeah, I'm booting it, I'm booting from local storage, I'm then going to look for a network connection, oh look, I found one, here's my IP address, um, I'm going to check to see whether I need to update, load all my modules, oh hooray, off we go. And so when you're actually running, it looks something like this. We have a session chooser, that says what you want to do, these buttons slab in when you choose them, and stay slabbed in while that's running. Um, all completely configurable from, um, from a central position. And so for instance, we're doing video conferencing here. We've got a Windows session in the background here. Um, and we can, we can select web browsers. We can do all sorts of different things. And so the idea that we needed, we needed to address was also to make this modular so we could extend things. So we wanted to be able to add buttons and new feature types onto the, uh, the list previously. Um, now the good thing about this is because the, the kernel itself has this embedded file system, as long as we make that clever enough, it should be able to repair itself, it should be able to um, know how to get settings, it should know how to speak to all sorts of types of networks it's going to have to deal with, so it should know how, how to um, um, bring up network cards and associate itself with wireless networks and how to find various files depending on whatever it's come from and so it deals with all of that. Um, this is a small thing but then it needs to be supported by lots of back-end modules which it can load either into RAM if it's getting over the network or it can look, run directly from the file system. Now these modules are, are, are disk images created with MakeFS which just, just creates an FFS image. And these are configured as uh, what we in the NetBSD world call VNDs, um, very similar things in, in Linux um, FreeBSD, um, where you're just using loopback mounts or, or, or DMGs. Um, some of these modules are absolutely required. If you don't have them, there's no point going on. So these are things like X, 
and, and libraries. Some are useful, but you could get rid of them, like some of the user interface stuff. Do you actually need a window manager if you really wanted to get this small? No, not really, if all you're going to do is launch a web browser. Some are completely optional. If we're not bothered about offering users the ability to SSH into something, we can just get rid of that module altogether. And some have dependencies on other things. Um, and so if we're running software that requires Linux emulation, we need to have that Linux emulation there. Otherwise, there's no point in going on with this other module. And so we, we had to extend our configuration file. These things that were fetched centrally from the network in, in the earlier versions, we needed to extend that. But what this means is that adding a new type of session is simple, you just add an extra module in there. And so instead of just the basic ones that we had, we can do things like stream video and uh, DVD playback using uh, VLC from the Video Land project. We've got an integrated web browser, which is Opera with um, Flash players. We've got conferencing using the, the Mbone tools, which are pretty dated now, but they do the job. So we've got Vic Rat and uh, whiteboarding. SSH, VNC, and of course the ones we really need to compete anywhere in the marketplace, uh, Citrix ICA, Microsoft RDP, this allows us to run Windows applications. Um, we've got things like SIP, we want to do voice over IP, we want to speak to asterisk servers and things like that. Um, this means you can present this as a complete desktop re replacement because you can divert calls through to your thin client while you're working on your, on your word presentation or, wh or whatever you're, you're doing if you're just an off office worker. We can also add the cool things in like data logging. Um, because we come from a, um, an educational background, it, this would allow these things to be used in science classes. They'd be able to um, run logs of I don't know, specific light and heat capacities, all that sort of stuff. Um, and this variety of different um, Session types is completely unique in the market as far as we can see because everybody else is just thinking he doesn't need to be able to run Windows, possibly do a bit of web browsing. Um, and when you're running Windows in a multi user thing, because every single bit of graphics has come across your network, and now you've got things like Flash movies in, 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 in your web pages, it's never perfect. And of course, you know, YouTube and, th and things like that, you're not going to get fantastic performance. It's pretty good but it's not absolutely fantastic. And so if we can offload some of these things back to the client, things like the stream video or playing DVDs, then it means you've got something that we, you know, we were saying is multimedia enabled. We say it, people believe us sometimes. Um, right, this needs to have a small footprint. Now the way this works is that in the file system that we're embedding inside the kernel, we've actually just got one great big binary here with a whole bunch of hard links to it. it then picks the appropriate um, embedded program within that on the basis uh, of the, the, the name you, that you actually call it as. Um, so it's really memory efficient. It's very similar to BusyBox on Linux, if anyone's looked at that. Um, the whole kernel itself is, um, with the RAM disk in there, is gzip minus nine, which means that the whole thing is down to less than a two and a half megabytes, um, the TCX being our own client, which so it has um, doesn't need to have loads and loads of device drivers in there, which is why it's, it's quite small. But this this thing, as we as we saw before, can speak to any different network. It can repair itself. It knows it can it can check the software it's got, then see whether it needs it, it needs fixing, see whether there's updates. Um, it can deal with all of that. It can even reinstall itself if um, if for some reason the the disk you've put it on is corrupted. There are some magic key presses you can do at the start and actually reformat its disk and reinstall itself. Um, now, the other thing is that that's okay with the kernel, but we've also then got these modules. What can we do about these? Um, now, just at the right time, we came up with the idea of um, compressed disk images, uh, which were done to be sort of Linux, Linux compatible, but it meant that, so that these things can be uh, decompressed on the fly. So they're read only, but that's absolutely fine. That's exactly what we want. Um, if that hadn't come along, either I would have had to do it, which would have meant quite a big delay, um, or I'd have had to hunt around for other people, but that was perfect timing. Um, so someone up there's um, smiling on me. Um, we also then, in the, in the modules, we need to make sure that we don't, there's loads of stuff in there, that, there could be loads of stuff in there, but if we don't need it, we don't want it in there because it needs to be small, because we might be loading these over the network every single boot. Um, also, the new thing that's going to be out in, in uh, NetBSD 4 um, is a very efficient memory file system, um, which means instead of you saying, Here, my, my RAM disk that I'm going to be putting these modules in is this fixed size, it shall not grow, this thing will expand 
and, uh, and shrink as necessary, which also is really useful. So here uh, are examples of the components that make up Thinit 205, which is the latest version. Um, I've ordered them in size. Um, .enz files are the compressed modules. Um, KRN files are kernels. Um, the names are the different session types. So we've got RDP and VNC. We've got some X drivers here. Um, we've got um, conferencing, ICA, down to the big fat one, which is Opera. Uh, and the number is basically the version number of that release. And so um, 205 says you've got version 3 of RDP, you've got version 4 of VNC. 206 may have version 4 of RDP, that's the way it, it deals with all this. And when we total all this thing down, and I've realised it's actually, this actually makes it look worse than it is. Um, for the TCX, so we don't need all these other kernels, it comes to 34 megabytes. Uh, and I've, the reason it looks worse is I've actually included some X drivers in here that, uh, that wouldn't be used. Um, so that's pretty much a whole that's uh, the whole distribution. It's got X in there. It's got all the fonts. It's got web browsers. It's got, it's got um, flash players. It's got pretty much all the bits of client software you could think of. And the whole thing takes up 34 megs. Very easy to fit into flash. And remember, we've got 128 megs of flash to play with. It needs to be difficult to rip off. We don't, I don't want people stealing this. It's my hard work. Um, now, we can encrypt these modules. It's a good idea, but the problem is, is that you can't um, compress things very well that are encrypted. Um, and so if you actually work out the chain of events you need to do, we have a um, an encrypting file system, CGD, but the problem is, is that you, you need to point that um, at a block device. Um, and so I looked at this and I thought, that's just too much in a chain. Why don't I just get VND, which, which um, supports this, um, supports, already supports the compression. It's read only, so that makes it easy to deal with. And also, when you actually look at the way the compression works, it just does it in, in fixed length blocks. And so, just make this support the encryption. It's much easier. So I did that. Um, this hasn't been committed back into NetBSD, but that's not through my personal choice. Um, it's partly because when I suggested this, the feeling was, yeah, well, you yeah, know, it works, but why don't we do it the right way? Um, so let's have this multi-purpose thing that's got a general, uh, general system that we can layer in somewhere that will just do all this, which is, which is great, but it doesn't help me when I'm trying to produce a, you know, a product here. And so, nice theory, but it isn't here at the time, and I've got customers who want this, so I'm going to do it the easy way, and it works for me. Um, if I may ask, how does it work? I mean, your clients have to decrypt it in order to extract it, so how is it not get stolen? Well, this, this is, an, is an issue, and also um, going for, well, as I go to, the, to this, the embedded file system, if you went in there and you looked around in there, you'd probably find the keys. That's just the way it is, but the, the, the keys are encrypted themselves inside the binaries that are, are using them. Um, it is possible for you to come along and use the MD set image is the thing that sets this FFS image into the kernel and you can use it to pull one out of the same kernel. So someone knew what they were doing, they could take the thin kernel, they could pull out the file system, they could just mount that, have a look through the images. It does a few other clever things in there because, for instance, it knows that it's running from one of these um, monolithic binaries and so it will go through and check um, the number of links that it's got on the binary it's running from. And if you, just, if you just copied that and thought, well, I'm going to stick it onto my machine and run it, you'd have a link count of one. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's in this monolithic thing, it's got a link count of 234 or something. And so it, it tracks that, it does a few things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm not an encryption expert. There are better ways of doing this. Um, so, but what, the, other, the, other, the other thing which I, I've not said going back to the beginning is Presence is a really small company. It's basically three of us. Um, and the Thinit thing is solely me. Um, other people are supporting it, but in terms of the actual um, engineering on it and, the, and releasing it and all of that, it's entirely me. And so it's limited by my knowledge and my time I can spend extending my knowledge. Um, and so also thinking of doing um, signing modules 
and obviously license management, that's, that's pretty important because at the moment you could put this on as many machines as you wanted at, at a site um, and you know, if people want to put it on t twice as many machines, I want to have twice as much money really. Um, so we've essentially configured, um, it uses a, a config file which you can fetch with HTTP, FTP or TFTP. Uh, you can configure the path of that with the, with the custom DHCP option. Uh, supports groups and per machine settings, it's just a plain text um, file. It's very simple. Um, remote management, this is something we've added very recently. Uh, we've got our own protocol and uh, we have a um, little binary that you can run on Windows or on Linux. It will tell you to do things like shut down, reboot, uh, just to see, look to see what's on there. Um, you can even get to cheesy things like play bits of music um, through its internal speaker so you could actually um, start a tune playing across all machines in your room. Don't know why I don't do that, but it was a line of code. I thought I might as well put it in there. Um, you can also shadow the screen with X11 VNC. So if you've got a VNC viewer, you can look at the screen, which, is, which we find really useful for um, managing client machines. If, if a customer phones up and says, I can't do so-and-so, we can actually connect in from our offices into their, into their networks, into their servers, and then, then from there go out to their clients, and we can actually interact with their sessions and say, you know, what are you clicking on? And we can see what they're doing. Makes it really easy for us. We need excellent performance on known hardware. So the way we do that is we're very cut down kernel configurations. We know exactly what hardware is going to be in there. Um, and so it means you've got very quick boot times. There's no driving, uh, there's no um, probing for old hardware and you know, look, timeouts for ISA devices and things like that. And we've slightly tweaked some of the X drivers um, just to remove various bugs and things we've found. But we also need wide hardware support, and so the way we do that is we have a generic type kernel as every driver we can think of under the sun in there. But when you do that, we have the problem that we've come up against the NetBSD project at the moment is, is how many different kernel types do we need to, if we want this to run on everything, or at least everything that's uh, the same processor type, um, how many different kernel configs do we need? And we've got to the point in, in, in NetBSD that when you're building up a, a a build of the tree, spending half its time just compiling different kernels for, you know, for the Intel part. And you know, there's got to be better ways. Um, and recently, uh, another thing that Jared did is he, he, he knocked something up called boot props, um, which takes um, a proplib based XML file. And proplib is a thing for um, passing. Um, parameter lists and things like that between various devices and things in the kernel. It's, it can be shared between user land and the kernel. So it's, it's quite a, a rich way for you to get arbitrary information, configuration information in and out of, uh, out of the kernel. Um, but the problem is, is that um, from the user land, when it dumps these things out to files, it uses XML. And there's religious wars to do with that. And, you know, is this bloat? You know, we don't use XML in configuration files in Unix. Hmm, we need something that's, that's human editable. I need to be able to load this up in, into my editor, edit it out. Um, now, I don't particularly see the problem with this because, you know, you can handwrite XML if you really need. Um, but I think, this is, I think this is a great idea. And basically what this does is it uses... You can, um, you can use boot minus C as you boot the machine up and it'll take you to an autocomp thing so you can switch off devices. Um, and so it just loads these things in. So, but you can also use it to configure the bootloader. So it's very similar to um, uh, FreeBSD's boot.conf and also the, the stuff that's recently been added to OpenBSD's um, config, so you can edit the kernel config. But it, unlike the OpenBSD stuff, which is writing back the kernel, this is just a separate file. And so all we need is one, one kernel, and then there's a whole load of different um, configuration files for it. And this should run on pretty much any bit of hardware. But because of this religious war about XML, Jared has just said, here's the patch, if someone wants to use it, brilliant. But it's not been, it's not been uh, committed into the source tree, and, and we haven't used it yet, and as far as I can see, no one else has. And that seems a bit of a, a shame to me. Now, as we were developing this, we hit some big snags. Um, as I said, one of our um, products is based on a laptop. Uh, we just get these things from our OEM supplier. Uh, and they gave us this machine which had a different wireless chipset. And so we said, that'll be, that'll be fine, no problem. We put NetBSD 3.1 on it, which is what the product was based on at the time. Um, but WEP wasn't supported with uh, 
Intel wireless chipset that was being used. So we needed to switch to, to 4.0. Now this was June, July sort of time. Um, so I needed to do a lot of work to actually make this work because I knew that people wanted these things installed over the summer. Um, now I had fortuitous timing with these compressed VNDs. Um, this is where it came back to bite me because just at the time I was trying to switch to NetBSD 4, compressed VNDs broke. So I couldn't build up any of these modules. So but I had so many other things to get on with, I thought oh, it'll get fixed. Um, so, and it did, but it was, once again, it was, pretty, uh, it was pretty touch and go. So I had to rebuild all my packages, um, rebuilt all, all the software for NetBSD 4.0. Um, which meant I just have another round of working out what I could remove from these things to chop them down. I thought while I'm doing that, I might as well upgrade a few other things. And so I had to go to a new version of SUSE emulation, and I've had to chop bits out of that as well. I don't know Linux well enough to work out what I need to pull out. So it's all, once again, that's all uh, experimentation. And then I had to go for a new ICA client. They'd just done a new release of that, new features. We needed to be running the latest version of that. And that required extra Linux libraries, which in turn needed to be chopped out. And so we had a lot of work, very stressful time, um, a couple of months ago. Um, and then we had to get something that the, uh, they gave us another laptop, uh, and unfortunately X didn't work on it. So I needed to move to modular XORG, and I thought, I've been putting this thing off, I really don't want to do this, it's just going to be, get painful. I've seen all these things on the mailing lists, but then I actually had to go at it, work like a dream, thanks to Jörg. Um, it was just so simple, and I, I'd had to spend so much time before trying to chop down X because I needed to work out what, uh, which particular libraries I wanted. I had to write all my own bits of calling various little bits of, of make files to install these things. But because this is completely modular, I can just say, right, I want this drive, I want this drive, I'm going to have this font. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, problem at the moment is it's, it is a moving target, so I need to keep on top of this, I need to keep rebuilding it. Um, it increased the module size slightly, but that's mainly because I couldn't be bothered to chop out lots more fonts and work out what I needed. So I just stuck them all in there. Um, plus we had more flash nowadays. Um, but the problems that we have obviously come up against still is problems that we have throughout BSD. Lack of device drivers. Do we use binary le level, you know, binary objects to do these sort of things? Um, NetBSD take a very center line on that. You know, OpenBSD saying we're never going to use them. L Linux people say, well, we'd rather not, but hey, come on, bring them on because we want to be able to run on everything. Um, but when you start doing that, you then run into licensing things as well. Um, you know, is it going to be easy to, to actually put this in a product? Do, do I want every single teacher that I'm sending out on these machines to to have to go and read through uh, um, something saying, yeah, I want to use my, my wireless network card? I don't really want to have to do that. Um, I then saw uh, the Linux driver project um, that Luigi Rizzo did for, for FreeBSD and I thought that, that's, that's really good because it was particularly focusing on webcams and webcam support throughout BSD is, is, is horrendous. Um, everything is just ad hoc patching on some existing systems. Um, I thought this, this, is, this looks like it could be a solution. Um, so I, I discussed it with him a little bit and, and came up with a plan for the Google Summer of Code, but no one, no one took me up on that, which is a bit of a shame. Um, I'd have a go myself, but I really don't have time because I'm the one person who's writing this at the moment. Um, and so hopefully I can keep pushing people and uh, maybe we'll get there. Um, but on the same time, you know, the Linux people are looking at uh, doing user line drivers, um, which is... I think you know it could also be really exciting and, and really helpful in this particular situation. Um, and our auntie, or Porker, as he likes to be called, uh, has been working on the, this thing that allows you to run NetBSD file systems in user space. And so this is going some way towards uh, you know, what we're wanting to achieve here. Now, other problems: package source is not designed to be used on embedded systems. It's got everything is you know you've got huge dependency lists. Uh, you know one example is is GTK2, which just brings in the whole world, um, and so the whole thing you know is is over 33 megs. Oh, I really don't want that, um, but I've managed to chop that down to about three and a half megs as, as, a, as a thinnet module. Though it's not working yet, that could be because I've chopped out too much. But I think I'm pr I'm pretty much there. Um, Question. Mm -hmm. What about using packet binary packages? 
using? package. Well, if you do that, the problem is, is that they bring in everything. Um, and so we're, we're using binary, binary packages here. Um, but when you do that, they include things like all the header files and all the, the static libraries you may use to want to link it later if you're doing it as a developer. These things are designed as a general solution. Um, I don't need any of that. Um, and so what I've done is, is in our make file, I've actually removed all the bits. I don't, I don't need manual pages. They're never going to get read. I don't need header files. All I need in most of these things is just the, the .so file. Um, and it just and it, it does all that. Um, we can also say we only want to extract a certain um, list of files, which also you know works really well. Which is why we've got a lot of these package sizes you know way down. Um, the other big problem is we have dependence on Linux emulation here, um, and you know everybody else in the marketplace is either using Windows or they're using Linux for this, um, and you get Linux emulation for free on Linux. Um, but we're, uh, Precedence is a Citrix Global Alliance partner, which means we're, we have direct links into their, their people who work with OEMs. We get SDKs, all sorts of things like that. We spoke to them about getting source back in the past. They wanted $20,000 for it, um, which we said no to at the time. We may decide that's actually worth doing, and then we'd be able to get uh, a NetBSD native version. And I've had the argument with them that NetBSD builds itself as the most portable operating system. And Citrix is, is also saying you can run Windows on any device anywhere. Well, why don't we just speak to each other? Because even if it's not really being used on these arbitrary little devices, it's still a marketing tick point for you. It really, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's saying that you say you can run this anywhere. Well, look, you really can. So why don't we just do this for the sake of you giving us a bit of source code? We'll sign as many NDAs as you want. We've also been speaking to Opera uh, recently. Um, they said they didn't want to pursue a native version at this point in time because they refused to release the source and so their FreeBSD version is built in-house on machines that they manage. They didn't want to have to manage NetBSD machines at this point in time. Hopefully we'll uh, be able to carry on speaking to them and maybe get somewhere in the future. Now, exciting developments. Um, I'm not going to spoil the next talk. But uh, thanks to Alistair and uh, Auntie, we have Puffs Refuse, which will allow us, we can, we can have many more file system types. Uh, and now when, when you're running a, a remote Windows session from, from Thinit, you can export, when you're using Citrix, you can export arbitrary bits of the file system as, as drives to the remote Windows session. And so what this will allow us to do is we could do things like mount cameras that are mass storage devices. We can mount read-write the client PC's own hard drive, plus other things that Windows users wouldn't have even considered that, you know, you could mount CVS file trees and all sorts of mad things like that. Um, problem is, is that the API for this isn't, isn't fixed, uh, and Nantes found so many bugs in the rest of the stuff that there's virtually no chance of this being backported to 4.0. Um, which uh, I suppose also goes on to say why, why is that important. Um, and as we heard in, in the discussion this, this morning um, about the, the, the NetAsk stuff, you have to use, you have to use su supported versions. We, we, we can't pick a version uh, of a current operating system and say we're going to build something around that because we just don't know what the fallout's going to be. You have to work with supported um, versions. Um, we could also use this thing as, as a replacement for the AMD auto mount daemon because people are coming along and they're getting USB pen drives and sticking them in their laptops and they want to be able to see those when they're in their remote Windows session. Um, and at the moment we're actually doing this with AMD, which has also requirements of it being a sort of pseudo NFS file system. So this builds up the kernel size. Um, the other thing is AMD uses Simlinks. Um, and the latest version of the ICA client refuses to follow symlinks outside of its file space, which is a very good thing for security reasons. Um, the problem is that we now have to say, well, we, should, we don't want that security check because it's necessary for AMD. Um, other exciting things, we're going to have DRM coming real soon now. Um, that's going to give us high performance video streaming. Um, we've got power management framework coming along, which means that when we're running this on people's laptops, they'll actually be able to completely suspend um, on pretty much anything. And we can, we can actually monitor all these and, and see whether, you know, are the batteries going flat, all those sort of things. That's what we need. Um, and we're also talking about fixing 
that my, my hack for um, encrypting compressed VNDs, we're going to get better support on that. So future developments with Thinit. At the moment, this thing assumes you're going to have an Ethernet connection, but no, I want to be able to use this anyway. I want to be able to take my, my, my think like machine, and I want to be able to just Bluetooth into my phone and get onto the internet. And then I want to VPN over that into my office. Um, we want to have some more weird peripherals. Um, so for instance, in, in schools, this would be a touch screen and you'd see my pointer moving and I was doing that and I could draw things over it. Um, we need to get drivers for those. We need to do license control. We need to extend our management protocol so that when you're in a remote Windows session, you can launch things back on the client so you can go, right, yeah, I know I'm running Word at the moment and I want to watch a video, but I don't want to have this all chopped up at, uh, in my um, Windows ICA session. What I want to do is run it locally. So that's going to be great. And obviously, of course, there's lots of other NetBSD developments coming along and we need to make sure those are in there. So what's the problem with using NetBSD for all this? Very, sl very slow releases, big time bet between at the moment. And the problem is, is that 4 in particular has been really long, far too long to, to arrive. So on the basis of that, when's 5 coming along? Um, 5 is going to have these great features like Puffs, Refuse, all those sort of things that, that I really need, but when's that going to come? There's too many developers wor working at this cutting edge without doing the backporting um, and without us actually improving our release process. Now, how are we going to do this? It's also difficult to fund development. As I say, I'm one person, but we're getting money from this and I want to give this back to the NetBSD Foundation, but how do I actually say I want these particular things developed? Um, we are funding uh, Andrew Doran to do some SMP development, that's great, but there aren't that many other people that are available for hire for arbitrary work. Um, once again, BSD license is, is clearly better than the GPL, ideal for this sort of thing. But the advertising clause makes it a bit difficult to support it because you end up with a list of names that's longer than you know, on your glossy flyer than actually what you're trying to say about the product. You've just got a whole list of names of people who've worked on it over the last 25 years. So in conclusion, I find the NetBC is brilliant for embedded work. It's really clean to develop on. Um, it's got very powerful bulk cost building tools. BSD as a whole is great for product development. It's commercially friendly. Uh, and you have this integrated kernel and news land, meaning I now I can just pick this thing, make a product out of it. I'm not going to glue bits together. It has these familiar problems that we see throughout open software everywhere, lack of device drivers mainly. Um, but also I'd like to say, you know, NetBSD isn't a research OS. Um, striving for perfection on every single point can actually slow the progress of this, which means that commercial use of it is discouraged. Commercial use in turn will feed things back both um, financially and also in, term, in terms of code. And so you've got this symbiotic relationship. The two do n really need to work together here. And so when people are working, um, when developers are working, you just need to think that you know, if we can make it a little bit more friendly for people who work in the commercial arena, that's actually going to come back and benefit us in future. Um, and so that's it, really. That's a picture of one of our clients. Um, I could demonstrate it working, but I'm out of time. Um, any questions? Uh, I've never even heard of portable uh, thin clients before. Uh, how well do they work? They work really well because I mean you need some bandwidth, but because things like Citrix, in, uh, well Citrix in particular, so is optimised for 28.8 um, connection. And of course, with modern developments like lots of animations and um, sound, then you need you need more. So, for instance, high quality um, audio under Citrix is 1.1 megs a second. But it is entirely usable over a 28 part in modem. Um, and a lot of people would be using this for just running things like Microsoft Office, so things are pretty static. We're in some ways, we're making it more difficult for ourselves by selling to education because they're doing lots more uh, interactive things, a lot more anim animations. By the way, have you thought about the uh, No Machine MX? The which? No Machine MX. Yeah, we've looked at that. That's one of our potential um, supported session types. Didn't, I didn't see the point in it in, in myself. It's basically a veneer on top of the RDP stuff, which is limited itself within, within Windows. I didn't see... I, ICA offers so much, much more of a, a richer experience than NX really wasn't doing much over the, and above that. Uh, any other questions? In which case, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, possibly. It depends whether it's got a video up on it, but uh, yeah, could do. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>